I'm Jeffrey Rosen. I am the president and CEO of the National Constitution Center, and I've been here for about a year and a half since June 2013. I never expected to have the best job in the world for a constitutional uh, scholar and, and lover of all things constitutional. Uh, this place is constitutional heaven. It's a national treasure, and I'm eager to tell you all about it. But let me start by explaining how I unexpectedly ended up here. So I spent 20 years or more as uh, a law professor and journalist in Washington, D.C. My first job out of law school, I clerked for a year, and then at the age of 28 became the legal affairs editor of the New Republic magazine. Phenomenal job, which I held until I resigned just a few weeks ago, along with much of the staff. Uh, and I did a lot of legal journalism in D.C. and also have been lucky enough to teach at GW Law School for uh, a long time, since 1997. And I really had the two best jobs in the world as a law professor and a journalist. I had the pleasure of talking with, with, with you, Fabrizio, a few years ago from GW about uh, issues involving privacy and technology, uh, loved writing and uh, speaking about a variety of constitutional issues, and was very, very happy in D.C. Unexpectedly, the National Constitution Center called. They were looking for a new head and wondered if I'd be interested. My first instinct was no, because I was so happy with these two phenomenal jobs. But I went to talk to the Constitution Center Board of Trustees, and it immediately became clear that my great passion in life, which is bringing all sides together to debate not political questions, but constitutional questions, and their interests were completely aligned. Because this is the only place in America that has a charter from Congress to do just that. Our congressional charter, framed at the time of the bicentennial of the Constitution, says that the National Constitution Center has to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. So this is a private nonprofit. It's a beautiful building on Independence Mall, uh, right across from Independence Hall where the Constitution was drafted. So it's the most inspiring constitutional views in America. But it has this congressional mandate. And I became excited about the idea that in these polarized times, it was important for there to be one institution that brings together liberals and conservatives and everyone in between to debate the Constitution so that citizens can make up their own minds. And we do this in three ways. We are the museum of we the people, we are America's town hall, and we are a center for civic education. So let me tell you a little bit about each of those buckets. The Museum of We the People is this incredible building here in Philadelphia. It was designed by I.M. Pei. It opened on July 4th, 2003, and it contains some priceless documents, uh, including some ones I've just been showing to you, which include one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights, along with rare copies of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. It includes this beautiful space, space Signers Hall, where kids can interact with life-size statues of the American framers. There's an inspiring show, Freedom Rising, which really sets the stage for everything that follows. There's a beautiful permanent exhibit uh, where kids can interact with constitutional artifacts. And there's a series of temporary exhibits on constitutional themes. So I'm so excited that we uh, will be displaying one of the original copies of the 13th Amendment signed by Abraham Lincoln, We've had uh, shows on uh, freedom of the press and on uh, the year 1968 and Jefferson and slavery. Uh, this year, the Pope is coming to Philadelphia, and we're going to have a special exhibit on religious liberty with priceless uh, documents relating to American uh, freedom of expression. And this is the only museum in America that is devoted to the most inspiring idea of liberty ever, namely the U.S. Constitution. So that's the physical place where people can visit. You can see the exhibits. You can interact with judges. We've set up an incredible new program where the judges of the Third Circuit can talk to school kids about what it's like to be a judge, and we're going to take that national so that judges around the country can interact with uh, school kids. And it's a place for people to engage with the Constitution in a very tangible way. 
But that's only one of our missions. We're also America's Town Hall and Center for Civic Education. I'm so excited to share the fact that thanks to a really generous grant from the John Templeton Foundation, we have assembled a national advisory board chaired by the uh, heads of the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society. Lee Otis, vice chair of the Federalist Society, Carolyn Fredrickson, the president of the American Constitution Society, joined by their co-chairs, Rick Pildes of NYU and Nick Rosencrantz of Georgetown and Cato, will be chairing this advisory board that will oversee a series of national debates about the Constitution uh, across the country this year. So for me, this is like the Lincoln-Douglas debates gone national. It's so wonderful that FedSoc and ACS will nominate debaters uh, who will talk about the great constitutional issues around the country, and we will be videoing all of those debates and posting them on our website. These debates are not only uh, going to be videoed, we're also doing them with our incredible We the People constitutional podcasts. So every week I get to call up the leading liberal and conservative or libertarian or anywhere in between scholar in the country about the constitutional issue of the week and interview them about what they think. These podcasts are a runaway hit. Uh, they're getting up to 300,000 downloads a month. Podbeam, which ranks 700,000 podcasts, found that we're number two in the news category and number nine overall. And I just think it's inspiring to see what a tangible response they're getting, not only across America, but also we know from Google Analytics, which shows us exactly where all of our listeners are, a creepy tool from a privacy point of view, I say as a privacy advocate, but great if you're a podcast entrepreneur. We have listeners in Botswana and China and uh, around the globe. The idea behind these podcasts is the same idea as the ones we're doing in our town hall debates. Namely, we believe there are good arguments on all sides of constitutional questions, and we think by presenting them fairly and in context, citizens can educate themselves and make up their own mind. We're also holding these debates not only on our podcast, which you can check out on iTunes and also on our website, constitutioncenter.org. We're also holding them in partnership with our friends at Intelligence Squared which has a special series that we've developed about constitutional issues. And in all of these debates, and in the Intelligence Squared debates and on our podcast, we're insisting that we can debate any issue as long as we talk not about political issues, but about constitutional issues. So what does that mean? We had our first Intelligence Squared debate about the question, does the president have the constitutional power to target and kill American citizens abroad? And we, Nick Rosencrantz and I stressed at the beginning we don't care what the audience thinks about whether drones are a good or bad idea. That's a policy question. The constitutional question is, does the Constitution allow or prohibit drone strikes without congressional authorization, or does the Fourth Amendment impose limits on these drone strikes? So the audience initially voted, and the initial vote said no, the president doesn't have the power. But after Alan Dershowitz gave the best closing argument I've ever heard, the audience switched its vote and voted yes. That was an amazing debate. We also did IQ squared debates on campaign finance reform in the First Amendment, uh, where Floyd Abrams and Nadine Strossen of the ACLU defended the Citizens United position, and Zephyr Teachout and Burt Newborn opposed it, and there the audience voted on behalf of the Newborn and Teachout side. We had a great NSA surveillance constitutional debate. We've got one coming up at Columbia Law School about the president's power to declare war without congressional authorization. And it's just very exciting that these debates, like our FedSoc ACS sponsored debates and like our podcasts, challenge citizens to transcend their political inclinations and to educate themselves enough about the Constitution to be able to reach conclusions that might even diverge from their political conclusions. And I just find it inspiring that in these polarized times, people can have civil debates about the Constitution. Sometimes there are unexpected areas of agreement. We were talking a moment ago up in the Bill of Rights Gallery about that interactive, which allows you to trace the documentary sources of the Second Amendment. And I mentioned that we had a great podcast with Michael Waldman, one of the leading defenders of the collective rights view of the Second Amendment, and Alan Gura, the leading defender of the individual rights view, who argued and won two Supreme Court cases. And Gura and Waldman disagreed about what the framers thought about whether the Second Amendment was an individual or a collective right, but unexpectedly they agreed that most regulations proposed uh, by Congress and the states to regulate guns are constitutional. Uh, so the goal of these debates is not a kind of 
kumbaya consensus or people don't have to agree. It's intelligent testing of the best arguments on both sides of the constitutional arguments so that people can make up their own mind. And I'm just inspired by the response. But that's not all. The final part of our great mission, I've talked about the Constitution Center as the Museum of We the People and America's Town Hall. Our final mission is to be a national center, I, I hope the national center for constitutional education. So thanks to the Templeton Grant, our great advisory board, with the help of the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society, is going to create the best interactive constitution on the web. We have divided the constitution into separate clauses, and we're going to identify the top liberal, conservative, libertarian, and every other variety of scholar, so that we can have two people debating and also agreeing about each constitutional provision. So we're going to ask scholars to write a thousand words about what they agree that each clause means historically and in terms of settled law. And then we'll ask them to write separate statements about areas of current controversy and disagreement. So for example, we're starting off by asking Rick Pildes, a co-chair of our advisory board, and Brad Smith, a leading a uh, scholar of voting rights and campaign finance to say what the 15th Amendment means. And Smith and uh, Rick Pildes will agree on a common statement about settled law in the 15th Amendment, and then they'll write separate statements about current areas of disagreement. And we're going to do that for every clause of the Constitution, and I think that's going to be an incredible uh, contribution to civic debate so that school kids, because that's the main audience for this Constitution, 7th uh, through 12th graders, can both have faith in areas of agreement and disagreement about the Constitution. And we are talking to our friends at the College Board, which has a new requirement that all kids who take the SATs uh, and AP US history and government exams study the founding documents. And we're talking about ways of distributing this great nonpartisan curriculum to help kids study for the SATs, uh, to study for the AP exams, um, as well as to meet the constitutional history requirements that our most public schools across America have uh, adopted starting in seventh grade. What unites all of these exciting projects is a faith in constitutional education and a belief that the Constitution is a conversation. I'm a teacher. That's what I've uh, done, and I will always have my great passion be constitutional education. But the longer I've taught, the less interested I am in my own opinions and views of the Constitution, and the more interested I am in hosting debates about what the Constitution means. We can learn a lot from each other by listening to the best arguments on both sides. Sometimes we can even have our minds change the way James Madison so famously did when he initially opposed a Bill of Rights, but after listening to the good arguments came to support it. So I think it is really important for there to be at least one place in America where people of both sides, of all sides, because there's always more than two sides to constitutional questions, can have faith that they will be listened to respectfully, that they'll be presented with the best arguments, and that they can have a, a, a spirited and illuminating debate about what the Constitution means. We're going to do that here at the Constitution Center in every media platform, which is why I'm so glad to be talking to Fabrizio and, 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 and Governance Works. Uh, we'll do it with our podcast. We'll do it with video. We do it here in Philadelphia. We're going to do it around the country. And I want you to think of the Constitution Center as a place you can come to get fair-minded presentation of the arguments on all sides, whether you're a lawyer or a law student or a high school kid or a adult learner interested in learning about the Constitution for the first time. We all, as citizens, have an obligation to educate ourselves about the Supreme Court, about the Constitution so that we can participate in the great conversation that is the Constitution. It's a privilege of American citizenship. I, I'm just thrilled to be part of it every day, and that's why I'm so happy to be here at the National Constitution Center. I never imagined doing anything aside from the two things that I love doing so much ever since I left law school, namely teaching and writing. I decided in law school that I wanted to be a journalist, that I did not want to be a practicing lawyer because I thought I would not be very good at it and would not uh, love it. Uh, and you've got to do what you love. And if you love being a lawyer, it's really wonderful to do it. But my passion was always writing and thinking about the Constitution. That was what really excited me. So I just 
got the best break in the world when I was hired at a young age to uh, go to the New Republic. That was through no special uh, talent on my part, but, but largely by the fact that I'd gone to college with Andrew Sullivan, who was then the editor of the New Republic. So I like to say that I'm the Harriet Myers of legal journalism. Um, but that was an amazing break at a time when the New Republic was really, but there was no internet and it was something very beautiful uh, and meaningful in American life and it was an incredible privilege. And I viewed becoming a law professor as an extension of the kind of writing I was doing at TNR, being able to absorb constitutional arguments, learn, educate myself about topics I didn't know about and, and, and share them with students. And I would have been not only happy, but felt incredibly lucky to be doing those two things. Uh, and really it was just by the coincidence that the Constitution Center reached out that I agreed to start talking to them. Uh, and I, I just feel, as I said, that I'm in constitutional heaven. That I, it's, it's really exciting uh, in, let's call it early middle age, to, to find a totally new challenge that you never could have anticipated. Um, and this is just thrilling on every level. It's a, it's a big challenge. This is a big institution. It has a large staff. We have to um, not only put on these great programs and run a museum and sponsor debates and educate kids about the Constitution, but also I have to raise money to support our activities. And this is the most important part of my job. And if you are excited about what the Constitution Center is doing, think about becoming engaged with us. You don't have to give a lot. It's more important that you just sign up on the website, become a member, and show your support for what we're doing. When I started this job, I asked a friend what fundraising would be like, because I had done a little bit of it um, at the Brookings Institution, but not a whole lot. And uh, this friend, a former law school dean, said, if you're passionate about the mission of an institution, then fundraising is not a chore, but a pleasure. And I feel that way. I really, as you'll be able to tell as we talk about this place, am very fired up about the importance and significance of the work that the Constitution Center does as an island of civility uh, in, in these polarized times. So uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm privileged to go around the country to try to meet people who are equally passionate about our mission and want to be part of it. Uh, but it's all relatively new. Um, it's all challenging. And I'm, I'm, I'm loving all of it. It was striking and significant that the Chief Justice said in a recent speech, don't cite the Magna Carta before the Supreme Court. And other justices have said things like, don't cite the Declaration of Independence because it's not the Constitution. What I find so exciting about displaying the original documents and also this incredible interactive that I showed you earlier, which allows folks online to trace the evolution of rights from the revolutionary state constitutions through the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution to the Bill of Rights, is that you see the continuities of these documents and the evolution of their ideas. The, although the Chief Justice is certainly right that you wouldn't cite the Magna Carta as legal authority, it's also the case that Article 39 of the Magna Carta became the basis for our due process clause. And it's also the case that our due process clause wasn't created out of thin air, but was essentially cut and paste from the due process clauses that appeared in the colonial charters and then in the revolutionary state constitutions and then ultimately were uh, signaled in the Declaration and codified in the Bill of Rights. I have behind me, I think I can just turn around and see it. I don't know if it's in the camera range, but there are two books um, that I used a lot in law school, Benjamin Schwartz's great collection about the documentary sources of the Bill of Rights. And he starts with Magna Carta, includes the colonial charters, then the revolutionary state constitutions, then the debates over the Constitution and Bill of Rights. And I got a sense from that collection how intertwined the documents were and how there really was an evolution in rights and how much consensus there was at the time of the framing that people had certain basic rights. They were either unalienable rights, natural rights that came from God and not government, or the common law rights of Englishmen, like the Magna Carta rights and rights of trial by jury and habeas corpus. And how consistently those rights evolved in the pre-revolutionary charters, so that when Madison came to draft the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, he was synthesizing rather than creating. Jefferson also wasn't an original thinker in writing the Declaration. He's the most gorgeous uh, writer and most important constitutional philosopher 
in American history, but he was essentially cutting and pasting from George Mason's declaration. So that's why I think this interactive is so incredibly valuable. Basically what Zach Elkins from the University of Texas and the Constitute website and I tried to do is put online all of the documents that are in that Schwartz book and allow people to access them so they can see visually and thematically the evolution of rights. So that's a long way of saying it's really important to learn about our constitutional history and the antecedent documents, not only because it's really interesting and illuminating as a citizen, but if you want to understand the meaning of the due process clause today, you can't understand it without knowing something about the Magna Carta. If you want to know the sources of the uh, of, of the First Amendment's uh, guarantees of religious liberty, you need to understand the natural law theories on which the framers relied or uh, the Article Five Amendment process. You have to understand how they believed fundamentally that the right to alter and abolish government was the cornerstone of all other natural rights. Um, that's why for me this is not only history, although I think very passionately that learning history for its own sake is really important for American citizens of all ages. This is what, what defines who we are as Americans. But it's also important if you're going to understand current debates because there is such a continuity among these documents. The Chief Justice is not a doctrinaire originalist. So I think, for example, Justice Scalia or Justice Thomas might be more receptive to arguments about the Magna Carta than the Chief Justice is. But I think that he was making a point about institutional competence, that it's important to understand history for its own sake, but if you're going to argue before the Supreme Court, you should make legal points, and legal points are most uh, helpfully rooted in the totemic documents themselves, that is the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Still, I, I won't, won't try to channel him, but uh, as a, in, in his incredibly thoughtful opinions, he's deeply interested in constitutional history. Uh, he's studied and written about it, and he knows uh, better than all of us just how intertwined these documents are. So I, th I think it's a reminder that studying history is important for its own sake, but if you're going to make legal arguments, make sure that you tie them to concrete legal sources. There is no substitute for the thrill of seeing an original founding document in person and up close. It's great to look at stuff online. I think our website is phenomenal. I love our podcast. You could tell how excited I am about Rights Interactive, which lets you trace the documentary sources of the Bill of Rights. But actually to stand before one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights to see John Adams's uh, distinctive signature um, is irreplaceable. To see the first public printing of the Constitution you, um, is an incredible civic experience. And it is a living document, Not, I'm not making an interpretive claim, but just to think that this is the document that we, the people of the United States, saw for the first time, to imagine them clamoring to read and touch the first public printing of the Constitution and to debate it, connects these incredibly important constitutional and legal debates to physical artifacts in a way that connects us to the past. So that's why... I'm passionate about all aspects of our educational mission. This is an educational institution, uh, not only a museum. The museum is just one function of our educational mission. But the museum, part of it, is really important because it's the most tangible way of connecting to the past. That's why people flock to the National Archives. That's why I'm so excited that we are, uh, my understanding is, one of the only institutions in America, aside from the National Archives, at the moment to have rare copies of all three founding documents in one place. I think that's what motivates incredibly generous philanthropists like David Rubenstein to loan us copies of the Declaration of Independence and the 13th Amendment. He's talked very persuasively about how important it is for citizens to see the documents up close. He's loaned the Magna Carta to the Library of Congress. I think that's an incredible patriotic service. So there's a big debate nowadays about the future of museums in a world of online experiences. Should stuff be interactive? Is there still an audience for in-person interaction with artifacts? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that from a constitutional point of view, 
there really is no substitute for seeing the documents up close and personal. It connects us to the past more dramatically than anything else. I'm a teacher of the Constitution, and the National Constitution Center is an educational institution. We have an obligation to tell the stories behind the constitutional amendments, the historic stories, so that citizens understand what were the controversies that gave them life, and it's only by understanding those stories that they can make up their own minds about their current applications. So let me give the example of the Fourth Amendment. You can't understand its contemporary significance or make up your mind about what that significance should be without knowing the stories of the general warrants and the writs of assistance that inflame the framers. And that's why in our Bill of Rights gallery, you'll learn that the paradigmatic example of an unreasonable search and seizure that upset the American framers were the hated uh, writs of assistance that allowed the Crown to try to enforce the hated tax laws in Boston. And we note in the exhibit that James Otis gave a famous speech denouncing the writs of assistance. He said they put the liberty of every man at the discretion of a petty officer. And John Adams said of Otis's speech, at that moment, the child independence was born. Why is it important to know that story? Well, Chief Justice John Roberts told that story himself in his inspiring nine to zero opinion in the Riley case saying that the cops can't search my cell phone without a warrant if they arrest me. Here's my cell phone. Uh, it has my life in it. You can read all my emails and see my pictures and all my thoughts and uh, electronic data is contained here. And Chief Justice Roberts compared the search of a cell phone to the hated uh, general warrants and writs of assistance that inflamed the American Revolution and noted that when the framers talked about prohibiting unreasonable searches and seizures of our persons, houses, papers, and effects, they insisted on particular description of those searches to avoid the evils of the James Otis denounced. So this is living history. And again, you don't have to be, you can decide whether you're an originalist, that is someone who thinks the Constitution should be interpreted primarily in light of its original understanding, or you prefer a more expansive living constitutional approach, Whatever approach you take, it's relevant to know the history. Um, Ronald Dworkin, the former, the late uh, great liberal constitutional scholar and advocate of living constitutionalism said, we're all originalists now in the sense of recognizing the relevance of the history. And you just can't, to, to read those words in isolation, uh, you won't be able to make an informed decision about them. I also want to tell the story and we'll find ways to tell it um, when creating our interactive constitution about John Wilkes, the British mischief maker and rogue who denounced, who wrote an anonymous pamphlet accusing uh, the king's mother of having an affair with the foreign secretary. This understandably infuriated King George. He issued a general warrant basically authorizing his agents to identify the author of this anonymous pamphlet. They broke into lots of people's houses. They identified Wilkes as the author of the pamphlet, North Britain 45. He sued and said that the general warrant was invalid because it didn't particularly specify the place to be searched or the thing to be seized. And a court presided over by Lord Camden uh, agreed and said that the common law rights of English men prohibited general searches without individualized suspicion. So that story, it was Wilkes's papers and Wilkes's effects that the framers were thinking about when they wrote the Fourth Amendment. That story is immortalized in towns and children from Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania, to Camden, New Jersey, to John Wilkes Booth. And it's important for citizens to know these stories. It's also a teaching tool because you can't connect to the Constitution without stories. You need to know the human stories that excited and inflamed the framers. So that's why I believe very passionately that history is relevant uh, as a way of engaging citizens and that it's necessary if you're going to make informed decisions about the Constitution. The Supreme Court cites these stories. And I really believe strongly there are good arguments on all sides of constitutional issues. There are very few questions that get to the Supreme Court where I think the answer is clear. And when someone says to me, "This, the Constitution clearly requires this, I you know, reach for my wallet, or more importantly, for my, I'm now taking out lots of props, but my pocket constitution, 
which of course is produced by the National Constitution Center. Check in to our website. I think these are going to be on Amazon soon for like a dollar, so they're really cheap. Or if you email me, maybe I can send you one. But it, it's a great way, it's a great thing to carry around with you at all times, so that when someone says the Constitution clearly requires, you can take out your pocket Constitution, read the text, and start debating it. But in order to debate it thoughtfully and in an informed way, you're going to have to educate yourself about these paradigm cases, these historical examples that excited the framers. And uh, the Constitution Center is a good place to come. If you buy the latest edition, or if I give it to you, which I'd love to do, you can read this riveting essay by me and David Rubenstein, which talks about the relationship between the three documents, the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, which is the clever and unexpected title that we've given to our essay. And it's just a couple pages long. You can just download it free online without going to Amazon. We're trying to tell the story of the relation between the three documents. It's an example of how I think to understand the Constitution, you have to engage with the ideas, but you also have to delve into the historical controversies that gave them life. So how do we translate the Constitution in light of new technologies? Uh, this is, uh, I think, one of the most exciting questions in constitutional law. And the bottom line is there are no clear answers. You can argue it round or you can argue it flat. To say the framers clearly would have forbidden or blessed NSA surveillance is obviously silly since there was no NSA surveillance at the time of the framing. There was a great exchange between Justice Scalia and Justice Alito about this question in the case, um, it was actually a case involving violent video games, and Justice Alito said, well, Justice Scalia wants to know what James Madison thought about video games, and Scalia said, no, I want to know what he thought about the First Amendment. They also um, entertainingly and, and wittily uh, clashed in the case involving GPS surveillance. Uh, Alito said, um, you know, the framers didn't think about this technology. There was no GPS devices. And Scalia said, no, but there was an analog. At the time of the framing, you could imagine a constable hiding under a carriage and eavesdropping on the conversation. So we have to think about what they would have thought of the eavesdropping constable. And Alito said, well, since it would have taken a thousand constables to get the amount of information that a single GPS device can get over the space of a month, you'd need very small counts constables or a very large carriage. <laughs> really good line, and it shows how hard it is to come up with framing era analogies for modern technological questions. Uh, so all that means is that there are not clear answers to these debates, but it doesn't mean that the history isn't deeply relevant. So let me, as concisely as I can, summarize the best arguments on both sides of uh, the Fourth Amendment and NSA surveillance. I'm drawing on two phenomenal debates we had here at the Constitution Center. We did a IQ squared debate, intelligence squared debate on this question, which you can check out on the IQ squared website and on ours. Um, and we also uh, did a phenomenal podcast on it, which you can check out on our We the People podcast. So if you're going to decide whether NSA surveillance violates the Fourth Amendment, you start off by telling those framing era stories that I told a moment ago. The framers are concerned with general warrants and writs of assistance that allow the king's agents or government agents to collect a lot of information, much of it innocent information, without a particularized warrant in a search for guilty or incriminating information. It was a fear of, as James Otis said, the uh, petty discretion of an, of an officer and of looking for needles in haystacks. Uh, so then we turn to NSA surveillance. Uh, is the collection of metadata, that is the telephone numbers that we call, um, without a warrant for every domestic and international call uh, in and out of the U.S., a violation of the Fourth Amendment? Now, you can argue it round or flat, as the lower court judges have. One court, uh, led by uh, Judge Richard Leon in D.C., said James Madison would have been aghast at NSA surveillance because it's precisely like the general searches that the framers were trying to prohibit. He said, because our metadata can reveal so much about us, the people we associate with, uh, our intimate activities, and our uh, political beliefs and our hopes and fears, a warrant is presumptively required. Other courts, including the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Courts and uh, a district court in New York, disagreed. They said because metadata um, doesn't reveal the content of our 
conversations, but just the people we called, and because the court in the 1970s, in a case called uh, Smith and Maryland, said that when we make local telephone calls, we voluntarily surrender those numbers to the phone company and have abandoned all expectation and privacy in them, therefore no warrant is required. So the framing error history doesn't settle the question, and I can draw further distinctions about whether metadata is or is not like the writs of assistance that reveal the content of the colonist's desk drawers. I have my own views on this as a law professor, but as head of the National Constitution Center, I'm delighted to not to bore you with my views and tell you to check out our podcast so you can make up your own minds. But um, it's just really relevant and important to study that framing era history so that you can engage in this task of constitutional translation. One thing I do think judges uh, have an obligation to do is to take, to accept the challenge of translating these framing era stories into new contexts. It's not enough merely to say, well, the court decided in 1973 that when I used a rotary phone to dial a local call number, I surrendered all privacy expectations. You've got to at least engage the arguments on the other side, namely that there's a huge difference between one rotary f phone call and my cell phone and all of the calls and electronic data collected there. Uh, it has the potential at least to reveal far more about us. And then you can decide for yourself whether you think it is or isn't like a general warrant. But you've got to at least recognize that all of the hard, interesting constitutional questions are open. They're not clearly guided by current law. Uh, and that's why the whole enterprise of constitutional translation is so exciting. There's a lively debate in constitutional law about whether the framers intended for future generations to be bound by their own original intent. And some scholars led by Jefferson Powell uh, have said that they didn't intend for their own intentions to be binding. They thought that future judges would engage in the process of common law judicial interpretation that was familiar to them from English courts, and they expected that the law would evolve as it always had in the course of ordinary decision-making. Others, uh, distinguished scholars and judges uh, led by Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas take a different view and say that uh, original understanding should bind perhaps not even because the framers specifically intended it, but because democratic theory requires that only the text as understood in its original context is the supreme law of the land, and for judges to substitute an evolving understanding for the understanding ratified by the people themselves is an act of judicial usurpation. I'm not going to tell you which side to take there. There are really good arguments on both sides, and we could talk for a long time about that. Um, as to how much technical knowledge is necessary to decide these cases, some of the justices have got ribbed on the blogosphere for their lack of technical knowledge. Justice Kagan has joked that I think she's the youngest justice and the technology she remembers from her youth is Pong when it comes to video games. Tragically, that's my generation of video games as well. So, um, you know, how she said, can we presume to uh, know the most up-to-date stuff? On the other hand, she did not... Uh, suggests, and I agree with her, that you need to be a tech wizard, let alone a video game wizard, to be able to translate the Constitution in light of new technologies. The question of whether NSA surveillance is or is not like a general warrant may be informed by basic details of how the program actually works. It's important for the government to disclose exactly what information is being collected, when it's being accessed, and under what conditions. And that's why I think it was important for the constitutional debate for the administration finally to release the OLC opinions that it had invoked to justify the NSA surveillance to begin with and the uh, previously secret foreign intelligence surveillance court uh, decisions, just so that people knew the basic details of how things worked. And the White House Commission of, of the Privacy uh, Oversight Review Board helpfully collected information explaining exactly what information was being collected. And very distinguished te technologists like Ed Felton at Princeton um, help us understand how many people potentially have their telephone numbers accessed when the government is looking uh, at uh, what it calls several hops. In other words, not only if the suspects calls, but every person that person calls and every person those people call. So as um, Felton has noted and Judge Leon, I think, picked up on as well, 
if I am a suspect and call Domino's Pizza, then every person who calls Domino's Pizza might have their calls examined, and it can get into some pretty high numbers. That degree of technical knowledge of how things work is important, but you don't have to be a technologist, and goodness knows I'm not, to understand the gist of how stuff works. I vigorously resist the idea that only technologists can make constitutional conclusions. Uh, this is not uh, a subject for scientists, it's a subject for citizens and ultimately for judges uh, informed by civic debate to decide. Um, technologies change but constitutional principles endure and the basic question of how to translate the constitution in light of new technologies is one that belongs to all of us. Um, last time we talked, I professed my reverence for my favorite justice, Louis Brandeis. So now is the time for me to invoke him. I think we, his bust was at my, on my GW desk when we talked last, and he's now come to Philadelphia, and he's right back here on my bookshelf. I guess I can lovingly cradle him again. <laughs> I brandished him last time, so here he is. You're in Philadelphia, and it's with the greatest respect that I welcome Justice Brandeis to Philly to inspire me every day and to help me ask the question that I ask whenever I have a hard question involving the Constitution and new technology, WWBD, what would Brandeis do? So the best place to find, I think, the most perfect expression of how judges can profitably translate the Constitution in light of new technologies is Brandeis's beautiful dissenting opinion in the Olmstead case, uh, where a majority of the court in a very wooden and formalistic opinion upheld warrantless wiretapping on the grounds that the framers only wanted to ban searches that involve physical trespass, and in that case, the cops were able to eavesdrop on the suspected bootleggers' phone conversations without physical trespass, because they put taps on the wires underneath the sidewalks leading up to his office and didn't have to break into his office. And his, in his incredible opinion, Brandeis disagreed, and he says, time works many changes in technology and invention, but then he said the framers of the Constitution were unalterably uh, attached to the idea that general searches without individualized suspicion were unconstitutional. He told the story of John Wilkes that I talked about earlier and said that the wiretapping at issue in Olmstead was even more invasive than the general warrants that unveiled Wilkes because they have the potential to invade the privacy of people on both ends of the conversation. And then in this amazing, visionary passage, Brandeis anticipates the age of cyberspace, and he says, ways may someday be developed by which it's possible without physical trespass into secret desk drawers to extract papers from the home and introduce them in court. A far smaller invasion, he said, what was considered a violation of the common law rights of John Wilkes, we need, Brandeis suggested, to translate the Constitution so it protects as much privacy in the age of the wires as it protected at the time of the framing. So I think Brandeis was a living originalist. Uh, Jack Balkan has used that phrase in his new book. I describe Brandeis in those terms as well. And I think that Brandeis um, said you start with the paradigm cases that the framers were concerned about, you articulate the principles that they meant to protect, and then you translate the Constitution so it protects not more or less privacy, but the same amount of privacy in light of this new technology as the framers would have insisted on. And that's why I think that uh, Justice Scalia, who would reject the f idea of being a living originalist, is very Brandeisian in many of his opinions, in his great opinions in the Kylo case where he repudiated heat sensing technology without a warrant in the Jones GPS case where he suggested that a warrant was presumptively required for the search of a guy's movements for a month uh, with a GPS device affixed without a valid warrant to the bottom of his car. Justice Scalia is accepting Brandeis's challenge to identify framing principles and apply them to new technologies. I can talk about why Brandeis is so important to me. He's just, I think, the most prescient judicial philosopher of the 20th century. He's the most influential justice uh, about protecting privacy in an age of new technology and also protecting free speech in an age of new technology. He's the greatest uh, critic of the curse of bigness, and he more 
presciently than anyone else, war warned of the danger of a too-big-to-fail mentality, which caused the depressions of 1913. He anticipated the crash of 29 and would have anticipated that of 2007. And if that weren't enough, he is um, uh, the greatest advocate of liberal judicial restraint, or call it bipartisan judicial restraint. This is a judge who generally voted to strike down few laws. He thought that the states were laboratories of democracy and should be given broad discretion to experiment uh, in when it came to economic legislation. In that sense, he has much that modern conservatives uh, might find appealing. But he also believed in enforcing rights when they were clearly articulated in the text of the Constitution and wrote the greatest First Amendment dissents in history as well as the most important uh, dissents about the Fourth Amendment. And if all that weren't enough, he also became at the age of 50 the, leading, the leader of the American Zionist movement, even though he was raised without uh, religious observance and was more responsible than anyone else for the uh, American recognition of the founding of the state of Israel. So he's uh, a great statesperson and a great justice. I think he's especially relevant now um, in balancing competing demands when privacy and free speech clash. This is the great constitutional issue of our age. We just have seen on the streets of Paris the agonizing uh, effects of those who are determined to silence journalists through violence, and also the very real tensions between the European conception of privacy as dignity, which generally is uh, sympathetic to bans on blasphemy and hate speech that offends the dignity of religions, and the American free speech tradition, which generally holds the truthful but embarrassing, embarrassing speech, must be protected unless it's likely to lead to imminent violence. Brandeis was the articulator, better than anyone else, of that American free speech tradition in the Whitney case, where he said that nothing short of an emergency, when there was no room for deliberation, could justify the suppression of truthful but embarrassing speech. On the other hand, Brandeis was also the most influential articulator in America of a right to privacy based in notions of dignity and the idea that emotional harm caused by uh, the instant camera and the tabloid press could be actionable. Um, I'm reading now a fascinating book by uh, 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 Professor Richards, who uh, Neil Richards, who argues that Brandeis changed his mind when it came to privacy and that although he had, uh, as a young scholar in 1890, been sympathetic to a broad right of emotional injury that he wanted to make actionable in the common law of torts, he came by the time of his totemic free speech dissents to see free speech as a more important value than dignity and to say that when the two clashed, free speech should triumph. I emphatically embrace Brandeis's mature view. I think the American free speech tradition, which Brandeis marinated, is the crown jewel of American constitutional law. I think the Europeans are going down a dangerous road when they try to constitutionalize the right to be forgotten, which is essentially a codification of the Brandeis dignitary right, which would allow people to remove truthful but embarrassing information of themselves from the internet. And I think Brandeis's struggles with the balance and his the balance that he ultimately settled on as a mature justice can guide and inspire us in these anxious times more reliably than anything else. So that's why I really believe that the question WWBD is a good one when we confront the challenges of free speech in the age of Facebook and Google and Je suis Charlie and ISIS. And I'm, only, I'm glad to have Brandeis near me always. I think Brandeis in, has, in, has been more influential than any other justice in shaping the Supreme Court's modern interpretation of both the First Amendment and Fourth Amendment, but he is more honored in the observance than the breach. It's a, it was too bad that Justice Scalia didn't cite Justice Brandeis's Olmstead dissent in his own opinions in the Kylo case, or that Justice Alito didn't cite it in his brilliant concurring opinions in the Jones GPS case, because they were channeling Brandeis straight on. Basically, they were uh, years after Olmstead recognizing Brandeis's insight that technological invasions of privacy, even when they don't involve physical trespass, as Alito recognized, threaten the same amount of injury that the general warrants that the framers feared. And Brandeis's Whitney concurrence was uh, embraced 
and codified in the Brandenburg opinion, which held that you can only ban speech if there's an imminent risk of serious violence. And that is the cornerstone, the foundation of the American free speech tradition. And again, it was Brandeis and not Holmes, who well, Holmes was, has also wrote beautiful and important free speech dissents. His metaphor of the marketplace of ideas and the need for people to have access to competing views so that ideas could be tested uh, on the battlefield of truth has, is a powerful metaphor. But Holmes uh, ultimately was a nihilist and a skeptic. He, was not, he did not share Brandeis's faith in the ability of speech to um, persuade and of citizens through deliberation to agree at common ends. And, and it was also Brandeis and not Holmes who came up with the idea that you needed a serious risk of imminent violence in order to justify the suppression of speech. So I think Brandeis is in fact hugely influential. I think his influence will grow as the court confronts issues involving the intersection of speech and privacy in an age of new technology. I just think it's time for more acknowledgement of his influence. I was delighted to see Justice Kagan give a shout out to Justice Brandeis in her talk at Princeton recently. She occupies Brandeis', Brandeis seat and she's occupying it very honorably and she is giving her great predecessor uh, the respect that he's due. James Madison was passionately devoted to the idea that citizens had an obligation to read laws and read the Constitution so they could contribute to a debate about its meaning and make up their own minds. Yesterday at the Constitution Center, we had a wonderful visit with Chief Judge Robert Katzman, who's written just a great book called Interpreting Statutes. And in that book, Judge Katzman, first of all, makes the provocative claim that Congress intends for judges to read committee reports and legislative history, that administrative agencies rely on this legislative history, and that the claim which Judge Katzman identifies with Justice Scalia, that judges should ignore this history and instead apply formal canons of interpretation, is explicitly contrary both to Congress's expectations and to Madison's expectations as well. And Katzman quotes Madison worrying about laws becoming too technical so that citizens wouldn't be able to engage and understand them. Uh, I think more than ever in this time of the democratization of public discourse, the best thing about the internet and the video revolution is that we can have conversations like this and all citizens can participate in them. And there's no excuse if you're a citizen watching this not to educate yourself about the Constitution. All of the materials are available to you. You can go online. You can go to the uh, first of all, the best source of all, which is the Constitution Center website, constitutioncenter.org. Listen to our podcast. Go to uh, uh, SCOTUS blog and, and, and Fabrizio's great uh, site and w watch these videos. Um, but um, delve into an issue. Of course, the, the, the real best thing you can do is read the primary sources. So pick, here's a homework assignment, if you don't mind one from a law professor. Pick a topic that interests you that the Supreme Court has recently decided or is currently decided. We talk, I talked about the Jones GPS case. You can go find it on the Supreme Court website in a second, U.S. v. Jones. Start clicking on the links. Uh, you can start by reading the briefs in the case. And if you're not a lawyer, believe me, you don't have to read every word. These briefs are really long. You can skim them and get the basic principles on both sides. Uh, then read the transcripts of the oral argument. We just did a podcast today about the great case involving judicial solicitations for campaign contributions. Uh, the oral arguments for that case were online yesterday within an hour after the argument finished. You can read them yourself and make an informed decision about them. Uh, read around the internet about the news coverage of the arguments. Then most importantly, read the decisions once they come down. That's why they're posted online. And But read both sides. Often there's a majority opinion and a dissenting opinion. And sometimes there's a concurrence where a justice will agree with the majority but set out his or her separate views. Again, don't be deterred by the footnotes or the legal citations. These are about basic principles. And if you read strategically and with confidence and know when to skim and when to read carefully, you're going to get the gist, the basic principles at issue in each case. Think seriously about the arguments on both sides and then make up your own mind. And then talk about it with your fellow citizens. I, one thing I love to do, you're going to 
I don't know what you're going to think about my poor kids for this, but my kids are eight, and we like to have little constitutional <laughs> debates about the questions you and I have been talking about now, about whether it's NSA surveillance is an unreasonable search or whether uh, capital punishment is cruel and unusual punish punishment. And they disagree. They're very different people, and they're extremely articulate, and they have instincts about these things. But we have enough background information that we can have a constitutional debate. And sometimes we change each other's mind. So I just think, first of all, it's incredibly interesting and uh, engaging, and I dare I say even fun to be able to participate in these debates. But it's more than fun. It's also, it's a duty. Uh, the duty is a word we don't use much, but Brandeis used it a lot. He, he thought that citizenship uh, reached its apogee in the fifth century Athenian polis. His favorite book was called The Greek Polis by Alfred Zimmern. And he thought that the uh, Athenian city-state in which citizens would deliberate about serious questions and reach common decisions was the highest fulfillment of people's faculties. It was men in those days, and, and the, uh, thankfully the gender discrimination at the heart of the Greek polis and the original U.S. Constitution has been overcome uh, to some degree by the 19th Amendment. But Brandeis's notion that citizens have not only the right but the duty to educate themselves, to, to deliberate about constitutional matters, and that in doing so, they develop their faculties. He talked about making people free to develop their faculties. We're not fully human, Brandeis thought. We don't achieve our full potential as citizens unless we better ourselves through education. And I really believe that strongly. I feel so lucky to be able to be at the, to be part of this educational enterprise to provide a platform and a forum for this kind of constitutional education. And I'm encouraging you to join me in this great enterprise, educate yourself, and make up your own mind about what the Constitution means. I believe very passionately that there is a meaningful distinction between political arguments and constitutional arguments. When I teach constitutional law, I be begin the first day of class by saying, don't assume it's all politics. You can suspect that, you can conclude that on your way home, you can end the class by thinking that. But if you just approach every case thinking judges are just politicians in robes and are just voting their political preferences, you're going to miss everything that's constraining and beautiful and meaningful and distinctive about constitutional law as opposed to political decisions. And here at the National Constitution Center, I really am trying to take this line seriously between constitutional and political arguments. We have a mandate to be nonpartisan. That means we cannot discuss policy issues or have political debates. Uh, however, we can discuss any issue as a constitutional debate. So we can't discuss whether gun control is a good or bad idea. You can think whatever you want about that. But we can and must discuss, does the Second Amendment allow or prohibit gun regulations? We wouldn't have a debate about whether NSA surveillance is good or bad. But we absolutely will and have had debates about whether the Fourth Amendment allows or prohibits NSA surveillance. This is a law professor's line, I know, and it's not intuitive. And uh, the truth is that many of my fellow law professors and many citizens are skeptical of this line. And I'm not naive about this line. I am familiar with extensive uh, literature suggesting that there's often a high correlation between judges' political views and their constitutional conclusions. I wrote a book, uh, 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 unjustly uh, uh, languishing. I think my mom read it, but it's, it's a really great book. It's called The Most Democratic Branch, How the Courts Serve America. And as you can tell from the thrilling and gripping title, the argument of this book is that basically courts over time have tended to follow the broad currents of public opinion when it comes to constitutional matters. And on the rare occasions when they've tried to thwart deeply felt constitutional views on the part of the public, they've provoked backlashes that have often provoked a judicial retreat. So I not only accept, but, you know, uh, have really written a bit about how, in practice, the idea that the courts follow the election returns is true. But that doesn't mean that we can leap from that empirical conclusion to the crude and I think inaccurate idea that there's no meaningful distinction between constitutional politics and constitutional law. We can point to important examples where judges reach political uh, constitutional conclusions that differ from their political ones. Justice Scalia often gives the example of how he voted to strike down a law prohibiting flag burning, even though he himself is no supporter of flag burning. He's voted to require 
of the accused to confront their accusers in person because he thinks the confrontation clause requires it, even though he's no fan of accused criminals. Um, and there are plenty of other examples. I think that when Chief Justice Roberts cast his path-breaking and tie-breaking vote in the Affordable Health Care case, he did so because he thought that it was important for citizens to perceive the court as something larger than the political preferences of its members, and he thought it was bad for the court and bad for the country, as he said in interviews, for citizens to perceive five Republican judges and four Democratic justices and nothing more than that. So the ultimate mixture of law and politics is a complicated question. Empirically, it's worth debating and studying as a scholarly matter, but it doesn't uh, distract me from my passionate and unalterable view that throughout American history, the Supreme Court at its best has drawn a meaningful distinction between law and politics. Just look at the inspiring opinion in the cell phone case, nine to zero, the Supreme Court in an opinion written by Chief Justice Roberts holds that the police need a warrant before they can search our cell phones on arrest because the framers would have expected no less. That's not a decision consistent with the political views of, I'm sure, many of the justices who are uh, pro-law and order, the liberals as well as the conservatives, I should say, uh, don't like to let suspected criminals free, but they did it because they thought the Constitution requires it, and they believed that that was their duty to uh, uphold the Constitution. So that's what we're going to do at the Constitution Center. We are evangelists for the distinction between law and politics. We are going to encourage and challenge citizens to debate subjects in constitutional and not political terms. And I can assure you, it's a really inspiring thing to do. We had an incredible evening. There's so many exciting evenings here at the Center. My head spins and I feel lucky after each one of them. But uh, last year, I guess it was, we had... Um, listeners from the local conservative talk radio station in to talk about the Constitution. And the rules of the de debate, it was moderated by Chris Stigall, uh, our friend uh, here in Philly. And the, uh, the rules, Chris said, he would ask me any questions. I said they has to be constitutional, not political questions. We all took out our pocket constitutions. Now I'm going to mess up my mic uh, for, at the end. And debated questions as wonky as whether the president has the constitutional power to raise the debt ceiling under Section 4 of the 14th Amendment. That's a question that law professors have only started to debate, but we read the text of Section 4. I talked a little bit about the Civil War history, and then citizens, most of whom were not lawyers, debated it. And although it was a mostly conservative crowd, we voted before and after, and people changed their mind based on the debate. And some said, I don't like President Obama and don't think he should be able to raise the debt ceiling, but some of them voted, I think he does have that constitutional power, even though I, though I wish he wouldn't use it. And some said, um, reaches the opposite and thought, you know, I broadly support broad presidential power, but think the president doesn't have it in this case. And after the show, after the debate, a woman came up to me and she said, I am a choreographer. I don't know anything about the Constitution. I'm not a lawyer, but I thought it was my responsibility as a citizen to educate myself enough about this question. And that's why I came here tonight. And I thought, wow, I sure have the best job in the world. This is constitutional heaven. So read the Constitution, educate yourself, and make up your own mind. And thanks for to Fabrizio for coming here to the National Constitution Center.